Slime Wire. Choose your own adventure. Come on, CJ, you see me when I ain't see you. Nigga, you ain't even make a move. So, how the fuck when you see me, you gon' shoot? I don't know who the hell in the booth. He said he gon' chill, he pop on my coat. Nigga, suck my dick like, ain't nobody gon' spend how I saw God. Hey, yo, Jack and I was that friend. Like, like smoking on yellow, no one did it. And be love, ain't still do shit. She get me a dumb ass, got hit. That's what I'm on. The flockers and Charlie don't hit without Benji. It's like how many dead niggas do I got? Three the guys that stole like a rock. He jacked what he cake and put in a box. I told Reba just let him some shot. No gun to go empty a top. Like we got a million ops. So we need a million chops. So G's don't crash, we ain't stopping for cops. And Nicky put this on my block. Like who got touched, like who got shot. And I feel in love with my chop. And I swear to my G, we fucking out. That's a bro, he get shot if he towing on Kelly. And I hope that I catch him with Kelly like smoking on Shit out you by my bitch. Me and my bitch a jump a bitch. Beat the shit out you by my bitch. My bitch like skin bad as shit. Valentine Day send the cash at quick. Her last man smoke bland and shit. Get me off the camera before I break your phone. Beat your ass like Nate Bray Jerome. Pap call from jail, told him I'm doing shit. He like what you mean, we doing shit. He like where you at, I'm just doing shit. Glock, I flip a doom shit. Hollows taste good to an eye. I said hollow taste like fruit. Put you in the mouth, it tastes like honeycomb. Kick you with my tips and feel like honeycomb. I just can't look like maple trees. With that bronze on, you about to get a ring. Saw the first nigga had a black chain. Look stupid with a painted chain. My goal was flat back on with a cane. Dubai you went to was not the way. Q rich necklace got a sickle cell. Sit down, that's a necklace, not a chain. Little ass necklace choking yourself. You so damn broke, how you cope with yourself? You so damn 
broken, so is your bitch. My bitch got more money than nigga named Rick. One eye with the glick like Slick Rick. Bad wood got me looking like Danny Glover. Bad wood got me looking like Fetty Wap. Bad wood got me looking like Gary Coleman. Bad wood got me feeling like Lil Dare. Feeling like Henry Ruggs in the Camaro. Bad wood got my breath stankin' in Beyonce. Bad wood hit like a world star fight. Bad wood hit like a head on head collision. Bad wood fucking up my 2020 vision. Glock make an atheist out of Jehovah Witness. On black ice, I'm still ain't slipping. Glock got me walking like with a bad hip. They like Neff, you just saying shit. Get me the fuck off your playlist. You don't wanna work, don't bump my music. I kill a broke boy for bumping my music. You leech your niggas, don't bump my music. Your feet stink, don't bump my music. If I was broke, I wouldn't even bump my music. You don't wanna go to jail, don't bump my music. You wanna live another day, bump my music. You want your bitch fuck, bump my music. You wanna lose your bitch, show her my music. My music can make your mama sell crack. Mixtape help grandma sell the perk pack. Auntie like crack dreams, I like that. EDM album, her brother like that. They like damn nephew black and no music. I did more shit than Universal Studios. Got more music than Motown Records. Got songs in the cut they don't know about. Got a verse with Michael Jackson in the cut. I stole that shit from Air 51. I see Donald Trump, I'm a piece of Had up. a dream, Joe Biden was crit walking. Chain uglier than Condoleezza Rice. I might quit rapping and fuck a politician. Terrorist act, blow up politician. I feel like the Russian niggas in Boston. The government brainwashed them. They ain't wanna blow up everybody that was running. Then they locked them up and tried to keep them quiet. Free Eric Snow, then the El Chapo. I break them niggas out the feds. Free everybody out the feds. Every 51 got some shit, bring back the dead. I got beef for Area 51. They got kids for cancer over there. They got good Zy over there. They created Bola over there. I know y'all ass somewhere in Colorado. Y'all moved from Vegas, went to Colorado. Utah somewhere in the middle of that country. I'ma link up with Donald Trump and kill the country. Christopher Columbus, did he see Area 51? Everybody he was with was on drugs. I feel like an Indian with a Newport. Got more cigarettes than Indian reservation. I got a tobacco farm across the street. All got syndicates across the street. My Indian homie got 30 marbles. I'm just trying to suck dick for a pack of marbles. My new wife pulled up with new boxes. I'm for cutting this shit out, you in boxes. These niggas trapped in the closet. Only got one pair of jeans in their closet. Boy, them jeans still is a fuck. Boy, you look like you still shop at Marsh. You got me thinking Kmart's still open. The Under Armour shirt came from dicks. All y'all can go and eat a dick. <coughs> <coughs> Business. 
にふさわしいフライトがありますサービスも食事もビジネスにふさわしいフライトに心を持てるビジネスにふさわしいフライトがありますサービスも食事もビジネスにふさわしいフライトに心を持てるビジネスにふさわしいフライトがありますサービスも食事もビジネスにふさわしいフライトに心を持てるビジネスにふさわしいフライトがありますサービスも食事もビジネスにふさわしいフライトに心を持てるビジネスにふさわしいフライトがありますサービスも食事もビジネスにふさわしいフライトに心を持てるビジネスにふさわしいフライトがありますサービスも食事もビジネスにふさわしいフライトあ<音楽><音楽> 
Alright, mahalo everybody. Uh, welcome to SlimeWire Podcast. This is episode 2849. Baby. And a mahalo to you. Uh, I am your host, Triton T2, joined of course by uh, Ike Man Sensei. Uh, Ike Man yes. Sensei, how are you doing? I'm feeling all right. I'm uh, recovering from coronavirus and a ear infection and also uh, heat exhaustion. So I'm uh, uh, getting myself back to health and feeling A-OK. Yeah. Yeah, I fell asleep at 5 a.m. last night. Uh, Uh, I do that pretty frequently. uh, Yeah, but I mean, one of my proudest accomplishments since coming to japan was that i fixed my sleep schedule so that i like i usually almost always go to bed at 11 and get up at 7 now but just a little bit it's crazy how just a little bit of uh, coronavirus can mess that all up i don't understand usually covid makes you like really tired and also you had covid like a week and a half ago how are you still like it did you get like I feel like because Japan probably contained it better than America did, maybe, you probably got one of the earlier, one of the more fucked up strains, maybe. Oh, no, no, no. We're up to date. I got BA5. Uh, Yeah, it was no big deal. But I was, I was like out for like five days, but then I don't want to go at length of my various health problems, but uh, I got coronavirus and then i got like a really fucked ear infection and okay you gotta you gotta tell me about this ear infection because i also had problems with my ears following covid and i think this might just be a case of of two different kinds of dudes you know two different ways of dealing with problems so i want to hear yeah yeah what you're trying to say is yeah, I'm weak and you're strong is what you're trying to say. Uh, that might be yeah, uh, sort of part of it. But like, I mean, tell me what your symptoms were all, you know, we can re- compare. I was I was clogged up in the depths of my lobes. And when I went to the ear doctor, he said, your shit is totally clogged up. It's in your inner cochlea. And it's probably why you're feeling dizzy because it's all in your inner ear. And it's making you dizzy because that's where you're like balance uh organs are so yeah like i was basically okay like i recovered from coronavirus like three or four days after getting it then after that i got an ear infection and then after that i was walking around and i got a little bit of like a heat stroke heat exhaustion type thing um so it was just a it was a case of compounding disease Okay, I see. But, like, what were the symptoms of the ear infection? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Yeah, so, just, like, my shit was all clogged up. My shit hurt. For the first couple days, my shit hurt real bad. And then uh, I was just, like, dizzy. I just felt dizzy when I was walking around every day. Um, And I felt dizzy when I was, when I had coronavirus, but I was, I was just feeling dizzy. Okay. And, uh... Yeah, when I went to when I went to the ear doctor, he said, "Yeah, that's because your shit is all clogged up in your inner ear, and that's where there's some kind of like organ in your inner ear." That yeah, yeah, it <clears> control. Makes, it's just a yeah. direct ties to your brain, so it controls like yeah, your balance yeah, and it functions your brain. And stuff. But yeah, I mean, I was dizzy yeah. too. You know, my ears hurt. My ears were all clogged up, and you know, I just sort of dealt with it. I just sort of strong manned myself through. Um, oh, look at me, I'm more against a strong man. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I also wanted to ask you, uh, sorry to ask you about your COVID experience, but didn't they have sure. you on like experimental Japanese drugs too? They had me on some crazy shit, which was called like the Japanese that was written on it. It was called like uh, Malanol, Maranaru, Maranaru. Is that what it was? 
Ah, I, have, I got it right here. Ugh. I was telling you not to take these pills. Yeah, Kadanaru. Kadanaru. And the English version is Kalanol. And yeah, I feel like I might have done like some brain damage to my brain. So sorry if I'm a little slow today. Uh, Cause I looked this shit up and <laughs> it was like, it was like, yeah, it's like a painkiller. And it also like directly taps into the uh, part of your spinal cord that regulates your body's, your body temperature to lower your fever and to like reduce the effects of fever. But this eh, that might just be what like regular ass like ibuprofen does. But I feel like yeah, like two hundred milligrams of this I took and I was just out. Like if I like when I was really bad with COVID and I had to like sleep, all I would do is just take this pill and I would just be fucking done. And it's supposed to be a painkiller, but it also seems to be a sleep aid of some kind. Um, so yeah, they had me on that. They also gave me these little packets of, like, crushed up pills. Like, pre-crushed pills. Damn, did you snort them? <laughs> I think that might have been what I was supposed to do, but I took them orally. Okay. Yeah. You, you they put were, them like, in just water like packets. Molly? Yeah, exactly. That's like exactly you're supposed to do something like that. And she told me to take one like in the morning, one in the afternoon and one in the evening. And I was like, what like what is it? Like, what is this? And she was like, just take it when you feel bad. <laughs> and I was like, all right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I was taking that and I was taking these other pills. And my God, yeah, I was a, uh, I was a wreck. I was sleeping, eighteen, nineteen hours a day, and that has directly led into my uh, fucked up sleep schedule that I got right now. Okay. So yeah, yeah, taking strange Japanese medication, I don't recommend it. Okay, I have one more question, then we can get off this topic. But like, I remember early on in the show, uh, we were discuss, you were discussing about how you didn't. You'd never wanted to get COVID because as a foreigner, yeah. you were afraid that you would be discriminated against in the health system over there. Yes. So, yeah. How was uh, how was their treatment of you at the hospital? Was I discriminated yeah. against? Oh, uh, no, I wasn't discriminated against. I was kept in a room for like an hour to wait. That's pretty while normal. they Yeah, while they prepared my shit. Uh, yeah, like... In Japan, you can't get a PCR test, or you can get a PCR test, but they're like 80 bucks, and you got to order them from the government. Uh, it's a big fucked up thing. I guess you can get them at a medicine store now, but they're still like 30, 40 bucks. They're expensive, and they're uh, frustrating. Um, so I just went to the clinic, and they just, yeah, they st stuck some shit up my nose. The ladies, you know, the old ladies that were taking care of me were all very... Uh, they were very kind. I think I was lucky that I got old ladies because old ladies are usually like the least racist Japanese people. Uh -huh. you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I didn't experience any troubles with the Japanese uh, health system. Although I did, while I was under quarantine, I was like, uh, like I would go out to like take like walks in the evening because you're allowed to take. I guess, at least in America, right? If you're on quarantine, you're allowed to take a walk as long as you know you're not going to interact with anybody, right? I mean, what are That's they going to do? Right? I mean, you're allowed to do anything, but... Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, one night my landlord called me and was like, have you been, like, taking walks? You're supposed to be on quarantine, right? How, how come quarantine? he knew that you had COVID? Dude, because he fucking... So the Japanese government contacted my employer and then uh my employer gave them my information and then the japanese government gave my information to the landlords that's fucking weird yeah it was wild i they just needed to know i guess and then somebody snitched on me that i was walking around <laughs> And all of like all of the people that live in my building, I'm pretty sure I feel like some of them know. I went to like I went 
to get in the elevator and this really destitute looking old man who's like back is broken and he walks at like a 45 degree angle you see a lot of those guys out here in japan uh like i walked to get into the elevator and he's like oh wait 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 no uh i'm actually going down i'm going to the second floor are you going to, you know, if you're not going to the second floor too you should maybe just take the stairs and i was like all right and i think he was trying to avoid being in a small enclosed space with me because he knew I had coronavirus. I, at least that's how I interpret it. That's pretty lit. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, I have another thing I wanted to ask uh, before we get into the the real meat. Um, do you really yeah. think that uh, that guy hasn't eaten in six days? Oh, that guy. Yeah. That, that well, big, I feel like fat, he... uh, guy that that, that we that know big, that Portland <laughs> staple. <laughs> yeah anybody who lives in portland you know the big fat guy yeah we're taking bets you know the big fat guy that we're talking about we're taking bets on whether on how much food he's eaten in the last week Six and days. my bet is a lot yeah <laughs> i i really highly doubt that he as he said that he hasn't eaten in six days um did you saw Dude. i i definitely showed it to you but that uh the typo of his like art projects that made it into the art museum. They kept the yes. typo yes. because yes, a misplaced <laughs> comma is just a fucking unforgivable death sentence. I think. Yeah, I mean, yeah. so the backstory on this is very funny. He put a very obvious typo in the title of his mm. art project, and somebody just—I mean, I imagine somebody was just trying to help was just like hey you know there's a little there's a typo in here and then he got very upset went on a tirade said they were gaslighting him said the typo was an artistic decision which didn't make any (laughs) it didn't make any sense and because this guy is such a a staple of the city of portland he got his work featured in the portland art museum typo and all so and like i just saw that it was there and i was like okay okay is it gonna be there and i read the whole thing and it's like at the bottom of the paragraph like they're like trying to hide it they're the official title of the work but um yeah i thought yeah, that they was really purposely funny. Did... yeah yeah i mean like no matter whether he hasn't eaten in six days he's definitely eaten for six days <laughs> at some point in time and it's still there you know (laughs) like he's eaten four six days in three hours when he was 17 and it never left (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's still around it's still hanging around it never got burned (laughs) off yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah yeah you ate four six days at some point in time. Yeah, and you, yeah, you still got reserves, buddy. So <laughs> yeah, it's it's no big deal. Yeah. Um. Okay. Well. Yeah. Okay. So the meat of what we're talking about today, we're gonna be talking about. Yes. Let's get to the meat. We're gonna be talking about vaporwave. Uh, is vape ah. is vaporwave dead? And what is post vaporwave? So, uh, ah. yeah. So George Clanton. Everybody knows. George Clanton is probably, I would say he's the person that has profited off of Vaporwave more than anybody else. Probably. Sure. Right? Yeah. I think that's safe to assume that. I don't know. I mean, when you say profits, do you mean actual monetary profits? Yeah, I mean mean monetary profit. Okay. Yeah. Pure, yeah. Pure bucks. Pure cash. Cold hard cash. Uh... Yeah, well, I don't. I guess I don't know if that's true, but I feel like just in terms of converting his vaporwave popularity into a post vaporwave career, absolutely. Yeah, I'd and say he has the, the strongest. Chart. I mean, the only other person I think that like you could maybe like maybe HKE during the two eight one four, like when that was really big. That's possible. Yeah. Or maybe somebody that runs one of these like massive vinyl labels now, maybe profit yeah. has profited more. But I highly doubt it. In terms of in terms of an artistic career, I think he's uh, he's curried the most favor and converted 
yeah, converted his start in Vaporwave into the biggest career. Uh, maybe what about uh, uh, what about Cherry Pepsi? Oh, Skyler Skyler Spence. Skyler, yeah, Skyler Spence. Yeah, uh, I I feel like he he bailed and he tried to do a post Vaporwave career early on uh, to some success. True, but I mean, what level of success was that? I I'm not, I don't know. I feel like George yeah. Clanton, like if you compared like followers on like Twitter or I think he, I think it'd be pretty easy to look up like Spotify statistics and I bet that George yeah. Clanton is beating him there. But I don't know. And I'm too lazy. By the way, to in that. terms of pure clout, fame and reputation, yes, no question. Yeah. So, I mean, so the point I'm getting at is that when people say that Vaporwave is dead, and many people are saying it. Many people are saying this. I've been, yeah. I'm one of them myself. Yeah. I've been hearing this. Yeah, I've been hearing it. I'm also saying make Vaporwave great again. Many people are also saying that. But it would make people sense that uh, George Clanton would want to, like, that he would not have a problem. Well, he would have a problem with that sentiment, and he would want to, yes. uh, d he would disagree with that, and it would make sense. And he rarely brings up like his own personal opinions about vaporwave on twitter or anywhere else but something yeah. somebody said or maybe the amount of people that have been saying that vaporwave is dead recently or maybe he has his ears tuned into this little podcast of ours maybe something uh, set him off to where he decided he wanted to say something about the state sure. of vaporwave and uh yeah. he, he very well might listen to the podcast he used to follow me on instagram he doesn't anymore. but um Okay. Way back, like in 2015, he was like following me on this Okay. But, um, so yeah, so he made this tweet, and I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna play it for you, okay? Are you ready? In 2015, people complained that Vaporwave was out of ideas and too mainstream. Now it's remembered fondly. Even in 2012, Vaporwave is dead. I was there. If you think Vaporwave is dead in 2022, you're just getting older. Like how your parents listen to the same CD every road trip. People new to the genre have a right to enjoy it. If you gave a problem, let the young ones have their fun. Electronic M3 already has twice the amount of attendees as Electronicon 1. And it was designed, with love, to showcase Vaporwave to a whole new audience as well. Okay, so that's it. Yeah. Alright, do, do you have any initial thoughts? Yeah, well, first off, where is it written that young people have this so-called right to enjoy Vaporwave as well? I don't think that there's anything uh, set in stone that allows that. And uh, uh, I was talking to you. I think that uh, Vaporwave and uh, the Vaporwave scene in general, much like all other digital media in the 21st century, uh it is going to exist for eternity and is going to crop up every 20 years or so. I mean, now we we lived through the birth of it, right? But it will soon, it, in like 20, 30 years, it'll be revived as a retro thing, just like everything is now. Uh, and so it'll never really be dead and it'll never, never really be alive. I think the problem is that it's cringe and lame now. And that's a much worse death sentence than uh, calling it dead, calling the scene dead. Um, yeah, I think that it's just part of the uh, part of the digital media landscape that music uh, it did, content never really dies. Now it just gets interacted with more or less. It is is relevant to a cultural zeitgeist more or less that goes so fast now that it's hard to tell when it starts or ends um but uh yeah so i think that like uh what he's saying is not necessarily false but i think vaporwave is it's worse than dead now <laughs> it's cringe yeah i don't it's, it's the true death of vaporwave it's alive but it is very cringe now so that would be my response I don't have a problem with anything that he's saying here, and I think what he's saying is, like, well-intentioned, and I think he yeah. is a pretty well-intentioned person. I think it is important to, like, 
make the point that yes, he is the one that would be incentivized to like he has the incentive to create to make vaporwave like fuck. <laughs> It, it makes sense that he would want everyone to believe that Vaporwave is still alive. Or, like, the Vaporwave isn't dead to him because it has helped him in his career so much. If that makes sense. He has something to gain. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, I was talking, I think we were talking, like, a little bit last week about uh, the early, the music culture of the early 2010s. And, like, that's the, yeah. um, the era that Vaporwave was born in. And I was saying that I think that that is the most important or maybe the best era for, like, independent music that has ever happened and ever will happen. And everything that happened, like, algorithmically to the distribution and the consumption of media and culture and music specifically um, has only gotten worse and it's, like, never going to get better. There will never be that yeah. sweet spot where millennials have enough know-how about the internet to create and distribute things illegally and to like yeah to like download music illegally to have like such a large range of influence and i think that's a very important point when discussing like the lifeline of vaporwave because when you're talking about yeah. like the young kids getting into vaporwave now the the simple fact of the matter is that they are not getting into the vaporwave that we were like getting into and they'll never be able to again because the the way of consuming music has changed so much since then. yes uh, I, I i would agree and i would say that young people today that may be getting into vaporwave are yeah they're entering a media landscape that has come under the control of big corporations and the uh, originally vaporwave came up and I think that you are right about the fact th that uh, the early 2010s was this sweet spot uh, after the kind of uh, the communicative potential of like the internet had been established and could and existed but before it had been regulated and controlled where people could just fucking post some shit onto soundcloud onto bandcamp and there was a community of people that uh just the distribution system like those artists could early vaporwave artists could post albums for free and then find other ways of getting monetized other than selling their albums. So yeah, I do think that that mix of early 2010s uh, of that media landscape was a very fertile ground for a new generation of uh, musicians. And uh, I do worry about the youth who are going to be consuming Vaporwave moving forward. And yeah. Yeah, I think another part of this like early 2010s theory that I'm trying to build is that um, like not only is it the media landscape of that time, it's also the generational like aspects, like the the fact that millennials were still young during that time, and millennials sure, sure. as a generation are unique in that we grew up with the internet, but we grew up like knowing more about not it tough. than we knew more about it than generation X, but zoomers yes. don't know as much about it as millennials because zoomers grew up with iPads and like they grew up with like media being, you know, so like centered and directed towards them. Whereas millennials yeah, had to knew. like, we had to like go on YouTube and find movies in like, you know, nine parts or whatever. And like under like figure out how to it. use Napster and LimeWire. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Figure out how to tour. Our knowledge of the internet is conscious, whereas theirs is unconscious, and uh, they are not even they're not even aware of what they know. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and so yeah, so what is vaporwave now? If if vaporwave is not dead, uh, but it is cringe. Is there another term yes. we could use for vaporwave? 
coming out now? Uh, well, I feel like it's uh, uh, the big story that we're living through right now in the vaporwave scene is the splintering of vaporwave from one big tent with various subgenres into a bunch of smaller uh, genres that no longer think of themselves as having anything to do with one another, you know? So, like, if you listen to uh, uh, Dream Punk and, I don't know, Signal Wave and fucking... Uh, Barber Beats. Barber Beats. I think that if you listen to those... If you listen to what people are saying on the internet about those various genres, I don't really think that most most of them think of the think of those three disparate sounds as being related to one another i think they're fundamentally different uh and they're fundamentally different scenes and they're different sounds and listening to them i i can trace some of the the genetics of like say dream punk back to tendencies in early vaporwave that were coming out mostly on dream catalog obviously uh but like yeah i mean yeah it's all completely fragmented and there it is there is no unifying sound uh and there yeah there's no unifying thing that we can call all of these various post vaporwaves well i mean that's that been be a nice. thing since the beginning like i don't think vaporwave has ever really had like a unifying sound i think the, the most thing, the thing that unified Vaporwave the most was its attitude towards copyright and the attitude towards like stealing aesthetics and yeah. samples and stuff, um, which, you know, yeah. I would argue is like a political ideology, but I don't think that's the case yeah. anymore. And there's a great uh, essay that came out by this guy, Van Pogham. I think that's how you say his name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I sent this to you. It was called the terrifying yes. rise of post vaporwave. So I'm 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 yes. gonna play a little a little section from this. So okay, all right, go. In contrast to an old vaporwave that mostly mocked and parodied consumer culture, post vaporwave celebrates capitalism with faint naivete, secretly priding itself on how well it can mask its greed ambition, and turpitude would try to simulate the mint merely to impress on an observer. I mean, come on, no one actually believes you enjoy looking like a Lisa Frank knockoff plastic dolphin from China that got left in the sun for too long and listens to music equally as slow. This new paradigm created by post vapor waivers gleefully perpetuates the dystopian reality that it once subtly cautioned against. At one point in time, let's say 2011, the genre was dripping with sincerity and curious flirtation with the potential for a new age punk mentality. Vaporwave would go on to collapse on itself by becoming quasi-popular on social networks, inevitably devolving into its lowest common denominators to keep its repetitious slow down droning easy to communicate to others, like a peacock but without self-awareness. To put it simply, Post vaporwave is popular because it's easy to classify now, whereas vaporwave at its start was not as easily put into a box. It went from being "is this vaporwave" to "this is vaporwave." All right, and that is contrast to what you said <laughs> earlier about the splintering of subgenres of like si signal wave, uh, broken transmission, yeah, uh, dream punk. So. I think this post vaporwave concept is mostly referring to the George Clanton scene. Uh, I think it could even like grow into like the Death's Dynamic Shroud scene and the whole scene yes. of uh, yes. like sort of vaporwave super fans on Twitter and uh, like I don't know if you like go to like Bandcamp and look at like the most recent like popular vaporwave albums a lot of them share a very distinct uh art style now and i think the reason that that is is because a, like it became very normal to um what's the word hire artists to make art for you and ah, there's only yeah. like a handful of like vaporwave artists like people that specifically yeah. create artwork for vaporwave albums 
And so people are just choosing from this pool of like maybe four to five people and all of their art is yeah. like really similar. And I think it's all For sort sure. of bad. <laughs> um, like, <laughs> uh, I think like go to like my pet flamingo. Well, my pet flamingo re had releases a lot of old stuff, but like there's like specific labels yeah. I could think of if I had time. But like, if you go there and you like look at every album, it's like, you know, it'll have the Roman bust and it'll have like the palm trees, but it's sort of like got this more like internet sheen, like smoother sheen on it that you can tell was yeah, made yeah. with like some, you know, some sort of Adobe program, which like looks good in theory, like oh. when you just look at it, but when you compare it to all of the other albums, it like loses an appeal. And like, yeah, yeah so if like, if by contrast you look at something like the Vaporwave Essentials Guide, which I believe was made in 2015, which only has albums yeah. from 2010 to 2014, the art style is a lot more varied. And like, you know, yes. you'll have albums where the al the cover is just like a random screen grab from a movie or a commercial blown up way bigger than it was ever supposed to be blown up or like, yeah. and so like the artwork is worse like it's not as like visually appealing but it is like much more intellectually appealing and like interesting in my opinion so yeah yeah so i think when yeah. it reflects on, it reflects an on more honest uh like i don't know uh internet aesthetic of like yeah what you were saying like blown up uh tv show screens that leave like artifacting so the qual the quality is like glossy yeah, like that's like that evokes a very specific emotion in somebody that has been uh, on the web for a long time. Yeah, I do agree with that. Yeah, so like um, I think that's the uh, the difference between like the older era of vaporwave that this guy in this essay is talking about and the newer post vaporwave that he's also talking about. Do you have any thoughts about that essay in general? Uh, yeah, I was inclined to not like this guy because I actually read one of his, uh, a, a long time ago I read one of, uh, another article that he wrote, uh, that was about how he single-handedly started the, uh, uh, city pop craze in the United States. Oh, yeah. Uh, I recall yeah. that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and he describes the scene where he tried to, uh, traditionally to receive a Japanese guy's business card in the traditional manner, and then he dropped it on the ground, and, uh, and it, which, you know, is obviously a grave rudeness that he committed. Uh, but that scene that he described was so cringe, <laughs> so cringed me that I, he really lost a lot of credibility points with me with that, uh, yeah, with that article. But it was very interesting, and I do think that uh, this article does make some good points about, especially, yeah, that last line where it's like, it went from being, is this vaporwave to this is vaporwave. Yeah, I think that's true, and he's, I, I think that he's, uh, uh, the idea that it vaporwave is now overly uh, formatted, overly, uh, uh, what do you want to call it? Identifiable. Yeah, yeah. Like it's, it has become too much of a recognizable thing, and that is why it is now losing its artistic interest. I think that is true. Um, when people talk about like anybody who says that the vaporwave scene is like too capitalist, I always, I don't know, I don't really agree with that in the sense that we've talked about this on the podcast before but it's like people that are like swapping people that are setting up like tape shops online vaporwave vinyl record stores and like yeah tape labels and shit that's not really I mean like you're making money but I don't I would not say that that guy is like a capitalist you know like you're still just a guy you probably have a side job you know, like, it's not exactly... I, I think people make too big of a deal about the profit-seeking uh, aspects of 
vaporwave as it's got popular just because i can't i still don't admit like sure like maybe people make like ten thousand twenty thousand dollars a year from these tape level labels but it's not that much money some people so, like yeah, live I, solely off of like these labels and stuff a, a, sm yeah. a small minority i recently there was this this is like a really weird thing that i saw there's this um compilation that happens every year by this label called doom trip and uh they do yeah. a compilation every year it's called doom mix and i guess it's like i've never listened to them but i guess they're very popular uh compilation so this one was 10 tracks like 10 tracks and there was a crowd-funded uh vinyl campaign for it that raised five thousand dollars damn yeah and I saw that, okay. and I was like, "You like? Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> like, that's insane." Yeah. But um. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's another thing that, like, yeah, the monetized aspect of this, I, of vaporwave, I've never really put that much of a. I've never thought much of it. I've never thought it was very important. But um, I think, like, the other thing that I usually think about in terms of that is that the people that are spending money on this shit are, like, 30 to 35-year-old dudes that now have, like... Giant record collections and stuff. Big record They have disposable income, and they can spend money on shit that they liked when they were kids. You know, that's how it always goes. But like you know, if you if you are really in the business of making money as a media, selling media, then you have to go for kids. You have to go for what the young people are listening to, and I just don't see a lot of young people spending that much money on this type of shit. But I guess, <coughs> I guess I could be wrong. Um, but yeah, uh, I do think that he does make a good point about how. Yeah, how Vaporwave became too recognizable, too much of an identity, too branded, and has collapsed under its own weight. I think that is true. Yeah, I just, um, earlier this week, I think, I, like, had a tweet about all of the, like, if you go onto the Spotify Vaporwave playlist, a lot of, like, old artists have changed the track titles of their songs to, like, oh, yeah, yeah. where, like, originally they had, like, kanji and like you know strange uh letters yeah and, japanese and korean lettering yeah, yeah strange like and it's all it's like literally it's old artists changing their old track titles to be more like searchable on spotify and about how i thought that huh. was really sad and really like shitty and uh yeah yeah the only person that like commented on it and said that i had a shit take i like clicked on their profile it was like a 15 year old so really? yeah, so, so there are like some young people that are really into this scene, which is interesting to me, which I wasn't aware of. I don't think. Yeah, but I mean, I guess that reaches back around to like, uh, you know, claiming that vaporwave is has become too branded, too recognizable, and too formulaic. Uh, that might be true, but I still like. I think what the conclusion that I'm re re reaching right now is. I don't know what that 15-year-old would define as being Vaporwave. I have no idea what he thinks Vaporwave is. I know it certainly isn't what I thought it was. So, you know, uh, maybe George Clanton has a point. Yeah, I'm, I'm not mad at anybody, but um, and I'm not mad at George Clanton. I, you know, I fuck with George Clanton. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think what else I had to say about that article. Um, or what else I was talking about, about Vaporwave in general. Oh, this, this is another thing that has been happening recently in Vaporwave, is there's artists that, again, in the, like, way, like, in their endeavors to profit off of Vaporwave and create more, like, standard careers for themselves, there's artists that are, like, doing a Kanye West thing where they are actually clearing their samples before they use ah, them. I see, I see. And uh, yeah. I, I said on Twitter that that is, that I respect the hustle, but that it's profoundly mm. non-vaporwave. It's not countercultural or transgressive. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And like, once again, I don't, like, I just, I guess I am 
I've been left in the dust. I'm confused because I don't understand in what sense having sample-based music where you clear your samples, even if it has a kind of vapor wavy vibe, a kind of slowed down 80s style vibe, yeah, that just, to me, that just is categorically not like Vaporwave. That's just, I don't know. Yeah, like sample based music. That's just so music, right? Yeah, it's just music. Yeah, like, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, Vaporwave, like, I think sort of transcended, like, the concept of, like, the music industry and of music culture. And, like, you know, it transcended, like, the concept of albums, because, like, Vaporwave albums are basically, like, mixtapes, you know? Where you just, yeah. you like literally affect the sounds, but you like change the title and you change the artist name and stuff. It's like the most pure version of like a mixtape. It's not really like an album. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, Vaporwave like transcended all of that. And that's like the whole point of why I ever thought it was interesting. So, it's just like, it's yeah. interesting that it's bigger now than it's ever been. But the way that it got there, was by sort of abandoning all of those original concepts and ideas that made it interesting in the first place. And now it's just regular yeah. music. Yeah, and I guess I just, uh, I have to come hat in hand as a humble and confused uh, uh, old man and ask, like, what, what differentiates a vaporwave aesthetic and vaporwave music from all other aesthetics and music that are on the internet right now or that are popular now because it seems like there's like really nothing unique about that sound that would differentiate it from anything else you know yeah definitely it's not like you can't differentiate it from like synth wave chill wave many cases yeah, like exactly. indie pop if they're like just singing over original production you know exactly i mean this point i've been trying to hammer this point home over the course of this podcast but yeah like chill wave took this route in 28 2008 through 2011 like chill wave tapped the lo-fi uh lo-fi versions of classic 80s songs a long time ago so i don't really know yeah like i just don't know what would differentiate vaporwave now from any of that stuff or any any of the legacy of that stuff that has trickled into popular music today uh yeah do you think there's anything happening in music right now that is as countercultural or transgressive as vaporwave was um I think that, uh, and, well, I mean, you know, I'm a stand for like the very early hyper pop that came out, like Sophie and uh, Dorian Electra was really good. And uh, yeah, like that stuff was really great. Um, I don't think there's anything that really excites me today. Uh, uh, no, yeah, I, w I wouldn't say anything. Yeah, I can't really yeah. think of anything. I think there's, like, arguments you can make for, like, SoundCloud rap originally. Like, how yeah. unsanctioned it was and how, like, I mean, largely, like, it was really popular, but it was also incredibly unpopular. Like, there's, like, tons of people that hated it with passion, you know? Hated, yeah. And I think there, there are arguments you could make with, like, drill rap happening right now where every single like big artist in drill is like facing multiple cases and like in and out of jail and like actually they're like actually street people whereas like yeah, that yeah. existed in rap but like usually the biggest rap stars weren't that or they stopped being that once they got famous but a lot of these drill rappers seem to never stop doing that yeah uh which is pretty interesting. yeah but there isn't there isn't just yeah, there isn't a one new sound. There isn't, like, a new sonic palette that is accompanying those drill rappers, right? Well, like, yeah, that's true. But, like, the other thing is that with that and with the SoundCloud rap, the goal of those things is to, yeah. like, make it in the traditional music industry. Like, that's the goal of 
that music and those artists. Whereas the yeah. original Vaporwave, like the goal of original Vaporwave was not to make, was specifically to not make it in the traditional music industry, which is why people stole music and, you know, which is why they put the track titles in unsearchable, like, characters and yeah, yeah. worked under impossible. pseudonyms and aliases, you know. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I do understand that, but yeah, I, I would say there is definitely no uh, no equivalent today of what that was. But maybe, you know, you know what? Like, if there is, we might just not know about it. Yeah, that's you know? true. We might just not be might just be a 15-year-old, and we will only know once those 15-year-olds that are making it right now come up. Yeah. So, yeah. Hurry up. That's my message to them. Hurry the fuck up, because, yeah, it sucks now. Yeah, everything sucks. There's a new... There's a label I've been listening to a lot, actually, that's pretty good. Uh, yeah? I'll tell you about it. Why don't we take a, a, a quick break, and we'll come back. Yes. I'm going to tell you about that label, and then we're going to talk about uh, that new Internet Club album. And I want to talk sure. And I want to talk to you about the Alex Jones documentary, which you didn't get to see. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Give me your thoughts on that. All right. Okay, we'll be right back. We'll be right back. Oh, I'm back. <clears throat> All right, we're back. So, uh, that label I wanted to talk to you about is a label called Dismiss Yourself, yeah. which uh, we referenced on an episode of the podcast because it had um, HKE's Nothing Culture on it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I was looking at like it had um it had like a Viper album on it and it had like an RX Poppy album on it. And then I learned like more about oh, this oh, shit. Yeah, I learned more about this label. It's actually really cool. They like sort of started the uh do you know about the like hexed sound? The hexed glitch uh, trap thing? No, I don't know. Specifically I don't know about hex. Hex I'm not sure about a H E X D. So there was like uh this rap, rap group called Reptilian Club Boys, and they dropped, like, yeah. I don't know what it was called, but it's like a 20-minute, like, little EP thing. And then some anonymous producer, like, bit-crushed it and made it sound, like, yeah. really cool and, like, crazy, and they called it Hexed. And uh, then that became, like, a big thing of, like, Hexed, like, glitch trap little EPs. They're all specifically, like between like 17 and 22 minutes because that's the specific amount of time it's supposed to take to like smoke a joint or have a uh, a chill smoke sesh with your bros so you put that on ah. so yeah it's like it's really conceptual and really cool and yeah this yeah. label like started that shit and they've got like a really crazy youtube channel because they started out as a youtube channel before they branched out into being a label on Bandcamp. so if you just go to the dismiss yourself youtube and click around it's just like full of like really crazy like little uh releases it's really cool and i also want to shout them out because the guy that runs that label has been curating and archiving a thing that i've used for years and i had no idea it was him but it's like a constantly updating mega folder of space ghost perps entire discography <laughs> nice. And like Space Ghost Perp famously like will drop projects under aliases and delete them and like drop random singles here and there and just delete them and everything will get like deleted after a while and then they'll make like a bunch of new accounts for stuff and like so it's like really hard to like get a handle on his discography but like this guy operates this constantly updating mega folder of all of Space Ghost Perp's stuff, which I've used like tons of times to find like old Space Ghost Perp tracks. Yeah. So shouts out, dismiss yourself. I think they're, I know that uh, HKE has been shouting them out too recently, saying that they're the coolest label of the 2020s. And I think he might be right at this at this moment. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm scrolling through this and I'm, uh, I'm liking what I'm seeing here. I will definitely give this a, a little bit of attention. Yeah, I'll say they're the latest album they put out. I didn't really fuck with that part. I thought it was kind of kind of whack. But like, but they've got a whole bunch of like really cool shit. Yeah, yeah, sure. 
Okay, so besides that, uh, I told you to listen to that new Internet Club album. Did you listen to that? Oh, yeah. All right, well, just give me your thoughts on it. Um, yeah, so, like, I really appreciate the... Uh, uh, first, the general... The aesthetics of the album. Uh, I really liked the, like, weird, like, clip art uh, album cover. Oh, yeah, it's super uh, cool. Yeah, yeah, and I, looking through, like, Internet Clubs, all of his other releases, I, it is this interesting, like, kind of like an alternative, like, vision of what aesthetics for Vaporwave could have been if the Japanese shit didn't, like, pop off, and they just, and it was just more interested in, like, regular old internet aesthetics, you know? Yeah. I really liked that. And, uh, yeah, I, I, once again, this is another one of those albums that's a real sweet spot between, like, ambient and, uh, uh, yeah, I guess it's, like, it's very light ambient where it's not these big soundscapes, but it's also not, like, it's not music that's supposed to get you, like, pumped up. It is supposed to be, like, background music, you know? Uh... And yeah, it was a very, it was a real good sweet spot for me in that, in that regard. And yeah, I just thought that the, they nailed the, uh, this kind of, yeah, like lossy aesthetic, uh, that I really, uh, enjoyed. Yeah, I liked so, it. Yeah. I thought it was cool. I, I fuck with Internet Club because he's a form, he's like a former 4chan guy. He used to post on yeah. yeah, he used to post on Mew with a trip code in like vaporwave nice. threads like back in the day. <laughs> and uh yeah, I don't know. I mean like back then I well I guess still now 4chan was like super edgy and like, you know, transphobic and Internet Club would get on with his trip code and like defend Vectroid for being trans to like all the 4chan people that were like calling her a tranny and stuff. Which Fucked up. So, but like, yeah. Shouts out Internet Club. He's super cool. I remember in the like original Wasex documentary, Internet Club was the uh, example that he used of like when Vaporwave first started gaining like an anti-capitalist aesthetic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because his like earlier albums are called like redefining the workplace and like and stuff like that. <laughs> and like he made like music videos with uh like commercials and stuff nice yeah so internet um, club's pretty cool yeah I, yeah i liked it I, it wasn't like it didn't you know totally fucking blow my mind or anything but i yeah i thought it was pretty good i like his older albums more um i really like the one called redefining the workplace the like there's like a track on there where um what's it called what are the two different sides of the headphones called <laughs> When an album is mixed oh, like that, is that mono or stereo? Oh, oh, oh! Uh, what the fuck is that? God damn it! Uh, phase. Uh, no. It's either mono or stereo. Like when it's oh, stereo, stereo. Yeah, stereo. yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, yeah. He has a track on there where it constantly buzzes from one ear over to the next, and it's like really fucking creepy and like weird. Um, and it's also just like this buzzing sound, like. But yeah, it's really, really cool. Uh, shout stuff. Though. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, we didn't, there was no other good music that came out recently. Sorry, guys. Yeah, well, we're not sorry. Uh, do better, okay? <laughs> Make some more shit so we can tell you what we think about it, all right? Yeah. And uh, it's not that hard. You just slow down some fucking 80 samples, okay? Yeah, it's really not Get hard. on it. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to find good ones. Um, yeah. I made a track with a. Uh, I sampled a, a Def Leppard song. It's pretty fire. Pretty fire. Oh hell yeah! Did you put it up on your uh, Twitter page? No, I'm still working oh. on it. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. Uh, I've been liking the soundboards you've been putting out for these uh, episodes. Oh, they're stupid they're fire! Good. It's. <laughs> I'm having so much fun making them. <laughs> but yeah, and I'm looking forward to. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what people submit to the SlimeWire. Uh, uh, record label. Yeah, we're well, ho hoping to get some releases here soon. I have to contact some people, but uh, hell yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, uh, you you didn't watch the Alex Jones documentary because you're in Japan and it's not available in your country. 
Locked in Japan. Yes, they don't want the truth getting out around here. Uh, you should get a VPN. You should watch it. You should find yeah. some way to pirate I've it. Wanting, I've been wanting to get a VPN for other reasons. So, uh, yeah, I, I think I will get a VPN pretty soon here. Uh, do, do you care to explain your reasons for why you need a VPN uh, living in Japan? Uh, no. <laughs> what You know, what I sort don't. of, like... <laughs> things specific to japan you know wouldn't there be a reason that you uh, need <laughs> just uh content you know <laughs> unmediated <I think laughs> un unmediated content unpixelated yes. content ah <laughs> uh, yes yes that would be that would be right up the alley i mean i haven't gotten in trouble for anything yet <laughs> but i do worry um, yeah, so that Alex Jones documentary was pretty good. It's not honestly, it's not as good as I thought it was gonna be. And like halfway yeah. through, when I texted you, like, "Bruh, it's lit," is it like by the end of it, I got a. Uh, I wasn't. It didn't really like go anywhere. I felt. Um, yeah. Well, I you were trying to drum up interest because I correctly assessed that it would be not a good documentary. And uh, uh, when did was... you correctly assess this? I said, no, fuck that. I said, I, fuck that. I don't want to pay any money for it. Oh, well, I guess that's fine. But, um, I mean, I guess basically, like, it just sort of didn't, like, I felt like it didn't, like, know what it was trying to do. Like, it could have been, like, a thing that explained Alex Jones, like, ideology, but it didn't really yeah. do that, cause he, which, yeah. I mean, is impossible to do because his ideology is so incredibly inconsistent. Yeah. Um, and then so it was it just like it was like a biopic about him. Well, that's the other thing is that it could have also been like a biography, like a biopic, but it wasn't yeah. really that either. I mean, there were like elements of that, and also they didn't have really any good interviews with anybody that like was around him, like in the early years, besides like a couple people. So it was like it tried to do both of these things, uh, but failed at both of them. And then gotcha. But there are, like, some cool, like, scenes. Like, one thing that I didn't know is that he's, like, a Bush did 9-11 guy. And he was that as the towers were falling. So, like, he, <laughs> he's doing, you know, he's, like, a morning radio host. And, like, 9-11 is happening. And he's immediately on the radio right. saying, this is a false flag. And You know what I think? <laughs> yeah, he's saying. I got a little hunch here. He's saying this is a false flag. He literally said those towers look like they imploded. It doesn't look like a plane hit them. And it looks and like they're just going to use this to, for so that we go to war in the Middle East. He was saying that on September 11th, 2000. Goddamn. Which <laughs> pretty fucking he's based. A <laughs> he is, he's a master conspiracy theorist. Yeah, he's the he's best. He's like a fucking like yeah, he is a absolute legend. The Mozart, he can just fucking pop it off the dome. He had it already ready to go as soon as it happened. Yeah, it's insane. And so it's like That's incredible. At at one point it like is he controlled opposition like does, does yeah. the deep state know about him? Do they tell him that they're going to do these things and then he gets up and says the exactly what they want to say? I don't know. And I don't really care yeah. because I just love him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, there's no way. Uh, I think that, like, he is definitely a human. Oh, he's yeah. He's no lizard. He's not a lizard. <laughs> he is all man, 100% man. But, he, yeah, he might be getting psyoped by, like, the FBI direct messaging him, pretending to be his ex-wife and telling him about stuff. I could see that. Yeah, there's another, like, really good scene where um, it's, like, Biden's State of the Union, or, af like, immediately after his inauguration. Uh, yeah. Like, January, like, 7th or whatever. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, like, he's, he's just playing it, and, like, he just can't stop himself from interjecting every few seconds, but he's not, like, angry. He's just like, yeah, this is the worst president we've ever fucking had. Yeah, he's a beater. <laughs> like, and he's just so matter of fact about it. And like, he's not even like, he's just like looking down and like shaking his head. Like, you really get the sense that he like, truly is like, just like, he's just at a loss. Destitute. He doesn't know what to do anymore. And that is like <laughs> another one of the themes that the documentary hits hard is like, because they have current interviews with him, like they interviewed him for the documentary. And the main yeah. thing that he's saying the entire time is like, 
we're completely fucked. <laughs> like, I know how <laughs> bad it is, and, like, it's going to get way worse before it gets better, and I don't know what to tell people anymore. Like, he has no hope for the future. He's, like, completely black-pilled at some point. And, um, yeah. yeah, it's so it's, like, it's really sad. At one point, he, like, breaks down crying, and he's, like, Jesus. yeah, and he says, like, I know what I, he says, I don't want to do this, but God told me I have to. And he's like crying and yeah, wiping <laughs> his tears. It's fucked up. And uh, yeah. And then like the crux, like the climax of the movie is the January 6th insurrection. And it shows you. So like the documentary filmmaker was with Alex Jones when that happened. And it shows Damn. you like what the media did not show at all. Because, you know, they yeah. painted him as, like, an instigator of the riot. But, yeah. like, it's, like, very clear footage of him on a megaphone trying to direct people away from the riot. And he's saying, like, we need to move to the other side because we're not BLM. We're not the left. You know, people are over there. Yeah. there there's random rioters over there. We're not a part of them. And so, yeah, it is, like, the ending is powerful because it, like, clearly shows how much misinformation there is about him and that Damn. at the end of the day he like was trying to stop the riot and that like isn't what he wanted to happen and i it's sort of a bombshell but i think like the cultural controversy that this is gonna like create is going to overshadow yeah. any actual discourse about whether or not the documentary is good or bad or uh, I see. Just because it has that little nugget in it. Well, I mean, just because, well, I don't think any, like, for, that's the very end of the movie. I think, like, any, like, big Hollywood reviewer, if they are even going to review the movie, isn't even going to get that far. <laughs> like, they're not, like, <laughs> yeah. they're not going to get that far. Or if they do, they're just going to ignore it and assume that most people aren't going to get that far. Or by the end, they'll be checked out. And, uh, like, yeah. I don't think they're going to paint it they're just going to say that it's a fluff piece and that it's bad because it's a fluff piece. And it sort of is yeah. like a fluff piece, but like, you know, I, I walked at the end of the day, I walked away from it, uh, only liking Alex Jones more than I already, gotcha. already previously. Yeah. Did. I mean, so, the idea that Alex yeah. Jones is kind of this at the very, at the end, he's a tragic figure who is trying to hold back the tides that he himself did. I think undeniably have a, hand in unleashing you know yeah there's a sense in which like if you want to take a very uh loose view of like causality he did you know he assisted in uh stirring up those waters you know yeah that I mean, eventually he helped create the culture into. that cr like created that event you know exactly and i think that anybody i think that any kind of person that is a liberal who's on the left is going to immediately say, well, it doesn't matter if he was trying to stop the riots. He had an, an unmistakable hand in creating them in the first place, uh, which is not the opinion that I share at all. But uh, that is that is a very beautiful image to me of a man trying to undo what he had wrought. Yeah. But it's too late. That is very beautiful. Yeah, it's pretty. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, you should watch it. You should like try and pirate it somehow. I don't know. Yeah, I'll figure out a way to watch it. Uh, are there any other documentaries that have been out that we should watch? Um, Anything you can think of? I mean, we should have done. We should have done the two. The two Intel documentaries that came out back to back, way like back in twenty twenty, but we didn't. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I. The what with that, I just I don't want I feel like if I watch those documentaries, I'm there. Those guys are winning, you know, <laughs> and I I just don't want can't bot to win. I don't <laughs> want him to do it. You know, uh, he is in many ways like he is one route that I could have gone down in my own life. <laughs> I could have gained about. 75 pounds and just been a pseudo intellectual intellectual on the internet uh and so that that part of me that is embodied in him i renounce and i don't want him to succeed 
So yeah, so yeah, I, I'm I am sorry. I I I have a high resistance to watching <laughs> those documentaries. Well, the well the other one isn't about Compot. The other one's just about like Pepe. But um, like uh, most people that like followed Compot in that like air internet era, like most people hate him now. He like burned yeah. like, all of his bridges with people. But um, I don't know. <laughs> I I still kind of like him. Yeah, well, I mean, so I think that Logo has over superseded him, right? He's now the guy. Yeah, I like Logo a lot better, yeah. Yeah, I do like him a lot better, but also, like, there are, if you look for them, there are so many just fucking takedowns of, like, he's wrong and lies <laughs> so often. Yeah, all the time. About his knowledge of the German language and, like, fucking, like, all this shit that you really should not lie about because people are going to be able to tell that you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. So, yeah. I, I, I have mixed feelings about him. Yeah, I mean, I just like him because, like, every time I open Twitter on my phone, he's in some sort of, like, he has he's, some he's on something on. going on. He's in some sort of dispute with, like, a bunch of people. And it's just, like, it's constant, yeah. uh, you know, it's constant entertainment for me every time i open twitter and it'll be like you know yeah. day week-long arcs you know where he's talking about <laughs> the same thing and different people keep like coming in to like talk shit or whatever um so I, yeah i don't know yeah i i read this uh a thread where uh a guy recommends that he reads this book and then he's like oh yeah i've read that book actually and he like this is what he says in the book and then the guy says, yeah, I made up that book. I made up the title of that book, actually. <laughs> it doesn't exist. <laughs> and it's like, that. there is not a bigger L you can possibly fucking take. <laughs> like, that is just straight up third grader fucking behavior right there. Uh, but yeah, no, I still, I do like reading his antics. And he, I, he does have a strange way of getting himself involved in, like, big conversations uh like before they happen or as they happen like that whole fucking starbucks barista thing the whole the whole quest the whole our baristas uh proletarian uh, proletarian <laughs> thing i realized that that was happening he he hopped in on that at a time where there was like a larger conversation that was about uh do is transportation like uh like does a thing still have use value before it is transported into where it's going to be used which was happening in a in the larger like socialist universe at the same time that he was talking about that and he kind of deftly moved his dumber uh his dumber argument about our baristas uh, proletarians, he sort of deftly moved that into that conversation. And I thought it was pretty impressive, actually. Yeah, and it became like but, the uh, forefront of that topic. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> he changed yeah. the conversation into what he yes. wanted to talk about, <laughs> which yeah. was funny. Um, there was one, like, Twitter space he did where, like, at the very end, like, some, like, lady came on and some lady that's like in a union and was like really looking forward to like getting in and debating. And it was like the last five minutes and he just wanted to like stop it. And he just like spurred the fuck out, just like shouted at her for like five minutes until she like shut yeah. up. It was pretty, Seven. pretty wild. Great. Yeah. Love that. I hope one uh, day we can hop in on the Twitter space thing and get some vaporwave nerds to come defend a dead genre to us <laughs> and we can just freak out, just flip the fuck yeah. out. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that sounds fantastic. Let's do it. Um, and yeah, I am, I am sympathetic to Ron Paul communism. I do believe that that's the way to go. Yeah. Ron Paul's lit. Hell yeah. Um, well, all right. All right. I guess that's it. Um, thank you for, uh, your time. Uh, I uh, sayonara, and uh, sayonara to you.